everyone, uh, welcome to this roundtable webinar organised by Land Management 2.0 on the theme of local food. Uh, I am Patrick Holden, I am the Chief Executive of the Sustainable Food Trust, but I also have a farming interest and they've asked me to um, moderate this session. We have an hour and we have three speakers, each of whom are going to address us for around five minutes and then I'm going to open up the discussion uh, to all the participants. Uh, a word about my own farming interests. Uh, since COVID-19, which has disrupted all of our lives so much, uh, sales of our cheese, which we produce on the farm from our 75 plus Ayrshire cows, dropped more or less to zero for about 10 days, after which there's been a gradual recovery due to the extraordinary innovation that's going on all over the country, and indeed all over the world, with an emphasis on more provenance and more local sourcing. And that is, of course, one of the key things that we want to discuss today. So our first speaker is Vicky Hurd from Sustain, the Alliance for Better Food and Farming. She's heading up the farming element of Sustain. She's got huge expertise. I've known her for many years, and I'm certain she's gonna have a lot of interesting issues to share with us. Over to you, Vicky. But excitingly, there's been shifts in buying patterns, which we've seen, and there's polls that, that demonstrate that. We've also seen a lot of local food and SMEs very rapidly embracing new routes to market, new ways to do that. And, and people, including us, have been providing links to how to do that. There's tools and online tools that you can do that. So we've been seeing people eat more fresh produce, um, cooking. They've got more time when that changes, may, may change back. But they might also have found, as Patrick said, they want to be healthier and more sustainable in response to what is a crisis effectively of our food system as well as other things, our, our global trading system. Um, but far more people are turning to, to box schemes, um, community sporting agriculture, direct sale and better food traders. More than 19 million people have said in a survey that they're cooking more from scratch. And... Um, 17 million are throwing away less food, which is really interesting because that's a very unsustainable part of our food system. But 3 million people have tried a veggie box scheme. That's 3 million people who haven't tried them before. So that's a big change. Traffic to Big Barn, which is a website that lists um, 8,700 local food producers, Big Barn, um, has found its um, num traffic has gone from 3,000 to 20,000 a day. So big interest in the better food traders, community supported agriculture, box schemes, farmers markets, sales have gone up 111% overall. And one box scheme has a waiting list of 6,700 people. It's a, it's a, a big, big interest. And um, I did notice a direct meat, which is a local meat supplier, which was selling to high end restaurants. It, it very quickly um, changed its sales when it found those restaurants closed down. In five days, it was selling directly online, which you know is an incredible turnaround. It just shows the flexibility of the local food system to do things differently and to find customers willing, once they understand what the situation is, to buy um, and probably possibly spend more, um, eat more of it, not waste it, um, uh, but not maybe go for the more cheap, cheap factory farm foods. So is this a sea change in consumer behavior? Can we capture it and, and really use it to create a renaissance in local food systems? I think it's too early to tell. How sticky food habits, new habits remain is, is, is a tricky one. Habits are ingrained. Um, they're learned over many years and at youth and they're hard to shift. So, I mean, one of the things we've seen is lower alcohol consumption. It'll be interesting to see if that goes up again once we can all go to the pub. Um, but surveys have shown this change. Eating more healthily, eating fresh, cooking more, understanding more of where your food comes from. So what we need to do is to capture that and promote it. There's three things I think we need to do. One of which is to campaign to retain those customers that have come to the local food system for whatever reason they did, it might have been convenience, but to actually talk to them and understand why they came and really respond to that and provide the, not necessarily convenience, not necessarily year round seasonality, because that's not what local food is about. It should be providing and sharing food in a way which is sustainable, um, but providing what people can cope with in terms of cooking. So it needs to be a campaign to do that and retain them and grow 
that sector um, because it does provide a really good opportunity for raising um, in, environmental standards on farm, animal welfare standards, it provides jobs. SMEs by definition are providing more jobs than enterprise at a local level. So supporting those should, is a really good thing that local authorities should be championing and campaigning for because that's good for enterprise and good for the economy, potentially reducing food miles, but you know that's, that's, a, that's a, a complex issue to do with transport. But we can also, the second thing we need to do is provide the evidence base showing all those things. The benefits and doing surveys of people why they're staying with the, the, the shops we're, we're going to start doing that with some of the box schemes and they're already doing it anyway um, so we need to campaign we need to provide the evidence base but importantly we also need to provide the government with a very clear message clear policy message and regulatory message about what needs to happen next um, and that includes Regulations so the hidden costs of bad food production are, are um, internalized, including cleaning from transport, including from pollution, um, including from health costs of, of poor um, farming. But crucially, for local food systems, we need the infrastructure. We need investment in the infrastructure so that small producers can reach their customers and through better food traders in the middle as needed. We know the Better Food Traders Network is, is relatively new, um, but it's found that one of the most crucial things that uh, happened for it to survive in this period was having a food shed where produce can be pulled from different producers and then given out to the veggie box schemes across, uh, across a region. A food shed takes money. It, it, you know, it requires money, not huge amounts, but also for abattoirs, we need small school abattoirs, um, uh, milling, processing, storage, marketing capacity, sorting capacity, all those things take some investment so that the local food infrastructure can survive and grow. And investing in that rather than the huge billions that have been invested into the multiple retailers, which over the last two months have benefited massively from government intervention. So we need infrastructure, we need support for agroecological agro and diverse farming systems like organic um, through um, changes in the agriculture bill but also changes in rural development funding which will probably come under something called the um, globe the prosperity fund and that money through farm support um, it's actually being debated tomorrow in the house of commons so we're asking people to write to their mp i can talk about that more if you want but to, to actually direct the financial support for farming which which will be maintained that it goes to the farmers that are doing the best for the environment for animal welfare and for local farming systems we need training advice and facilitation support and finally another um, area of um, policy is procurement we need to have dynamic procurement that allows small scale producers to combine and sell into contracts into schools hospitals care homes the public procurement um, budget is possibly around three billion. That's a big market that could um, really mean survival for the small and medium enterprises in the food sector. So making sure dynamic procurement is a big part of the future food procurement system the government um, takes forward. And there's a new report out on that that we've been supporting, which um, we'll be posting on our website too. That dynamic procurement key area. I've probably missed many, but those are some of the policy areas that that really need to uh, embrace the local food infrastructure. And I, I can also talk about what I mean about local food, but I should probably Well, stop. No, I'd like, actually, I would like, thank you so much, Vicky. You weren't short of material, were you, to share with us? <laughs> Sorry, thank you. It's very long. comprehensive. <laughs> no, well, it probably was, but hey-ho. Um, <laughs> but I would like you to just attempt to define or at least describe what you think a local food system is. Yeah, I think that's a really, a really good question. It's a system which is more retaining the um, productive capacity of of the land in an area through retaining um, recycling the nutrients so it's part of the food part of the productive capacity so farmers are working together with uh, mixed farming or livestock farming working with non-livestock farming to make sure the nutrients are, are retained and then it's actually selling into a system which is um, and they're also producing in environmentally sensitive ways and animal, high animal welfare ways, but they're also selling more directly to consumers. But you so don't have I'm a distance correct. involved. No, I think the distance involved is a slight, um, slight, it's part of it, 
So some farmers markets say it's got to be within 30 miles and that's fine. That's a good thing. But there is a, a zone in which you can get your food. And, and there's the first zone probably is to get the most perishable stuff close as possible. That's why we're promoting peri-urban and urban food growing. Yes, so growing food to yeah. But as you go out, I mean, I think this should still include, definitely include long distance traded food. As long as it's traded fairly, and okay. the workers yeah. are treated fairly. So fair trade and organic for overseas, but we need that, you know, that really needs to be part of the trading um, policy. But it's right, well, look, a zoning, a zoning okay. process. Local food is very much part of that zoning process. Okay, well, thank you very much. I mean, that's really set the conversation going about definitions or des descriptions of what local food means. Thank you so much. Also for all, all, everything you bought, Vicky, but we'll have you back in later. <laughs> so we better move on to Peter now. Peter Seger, is a very old friend of mine. We were both hippies. Well, I'm not sure Peter will own the term hippie that got back to the land in the 70s. Um, and uh, yeah, I set up a dairy farm and grew some vegetables at his request. Uh, and Peter specialised in vegetable production, but he then got very involved with large scale sourcing and distribution, actually from all over the world for the supermarkets. But then they rather behaved rather badly in my view. And uh, so Peter, we enter the second chapter of his career, which is growing and selling most of the uh, vegetables and fruit that they produce uh, in Wales. I think all is bit in Wales, is it, Peter? But we'd love to hear a little bit about your story and then share any insights you have about what Vicky said and about how you see this local food movement uh, having potential to go to scale and what, what, what the barriers are. Okay, thank Peter. you. Um, good, mor <coughs> good morning, everyone. Uh, very briefly, the story of Blind Camel, which is a farm I came to in 1974, is, has several sort of incarnations. And first of all, we supplied whole food shops and health food shops all over Wales. Then we moved to trying to in instigate the supply of fresh produce all, all over Britain through supermarkets which we did and developed and then we got involved as a small farm as the general scale of organic farms uh, got larger we were more involved in supplying national box schemes and then we decided we really had to uh, in our advancing years we really had to find a way to create a model that was going to be opposite for the future for our children who were going to take over and so everything came back down to looking at energy looking at the, our climate um, impact looking at the distance looking at the directness of sale looking at the type of outlet and we developed up a wonderful model that was basically um, orientated to um, farmers markets in wales some box scheme and restaurants and it was a brilliant model and working like a uh, just like a dream it was getting bigger every year it was working better we had the same amount of land producing the crops but we were getting better and better at growing them so everything was working great and then along came the big C and uh, and that was it. Overnight, we, like everybody else all over the world, had to go through change. Our market stopped uh, and we had to go online and do all this stuff, which I can tell you from my point of view, and anybody who knows me, would be a far-fetched idea uh, because I can just about turn on the computer for less than anything else. But we have in the family some people who know about these things, which is wonderful. And we're very grateful. Um, so we've done that and of course it didn't work very well in the beginning um, but now it's working fantastic so our sales are not up by the amount that um, Vicky was quoting but they're higher than they were before and we're very grateful for that because we are limited at this time of the year by supply so we're, we're you know we're not looking we can't buy things in to, to create a satisfied demand we can only uh, produce um, the crops ourselves but it is going better and we don't see any reason why it can't continue because this is the most difficult time of the year and it's a huge relief to us. The question is really on the local food issue, uh, how we 
go forward. And everybody is scratching their head about the future of agriculture at the moment. But the one thing that is completely clear to me, one thing, which is that the chaos that emanated from supermarkets at the beginning of this endemic is something that is etched into the mind of a large number of consumers. They don't want to go through that again. That is not, that is not a correct way to live. It's not a good way to live. It's not a healthy way to live. And I think whatever ha happens, and I share with you caution about what will happen in the future, but certainly there will be more local production. How much more? My feeling is a lot more, but certainly more. So how do we go about that and what do we do about it? Well, in Wales we have a situation where almost all fresh produce is imported from England and from around the world. Very little is produced at home. And yet we can produce uh, enough for a reasonable population in our area. And if we had two or three hundred more small units like ours, which is not- Peter, can I interrupt and just ask you to describe what your unit has, how many acres and what the crops you grow and all that sort of thing. Because you, you said, I, which really made a big impression on me, a couple of hundred of blind camels and we could feed whales or whatever it is. Mm. What is. What is your unit? Describe it. Oh, well, we have a small farm, it's about um, 45, well, actually 50 acres, uh, on which we grow about one third of about 15 acres of field crops and have them in the same quantity for decades and decades and decades. And we have one and a half to two acres of um, multi-span uh, protected cropping tunnels, large tunnels. And it's on a rotation that basically the field crops are on a three year rotation. We produce all the compost ourselves um, 95, 98% internally produced uh, materials and we buy nothing in, uh, no supplements or things like that in. Uh, we grow a range of crops. In the old days when we were in supermarkets we would have five or six crops in large quantities and we'd grow half a million little gem lettuce a year and heaven knows how many acres of broad beans and things like that. But now we grow about 50, 55 different types of vegetables and some fruits, primarily strawberries, which have just come into the season and are very good value, by the way, <laughs> nearby. Um, but you don't have, your, your multi-spans are not heated, right? And yet you no, no, them all year round. No, they're not heated at all and they're producing crops all year round. And, and the idea, the model we were trying to produce was could we, on our small area, produce a diet, a, a reasonably varied diet, for anyone in this country all year round. Now, for most of the year, it's not terribly difficult, but when you get to the time from January through to June, early July, that's a tricky sort of time. And that's the area we're at. Now, we're, we're now have been selling and are selling and will sell in this period, uh, around about 19 to 20 different crops. And there's enough there for a, a varying diet. It admittedly is very green at this time of year. Uh, you can have anything you like, more or less, as long as it's green. Um, but it changes, obviously, as the season goes. And we're just going into the season now. We're coming out of the really difficult time. But it's enough. It's enough. It is, and it's that sort of model that we wanted to get. And it's important to say that. So thank you, Patrick, for prompting me, because. We can't just expect people to stay with us for a few months of the year and then we leave them with nothing to eat, you know, for the rest of the year. We've got, and the only way we can do that is by having protective cover, protective crops. But we need to do it in a way that's as energy efficient as possible so we're not eating them at all. And so that's choosing the right crops. So our work is endless experimentation with varieties of vegetables from all over the world that make life interesting, um, make the taste exciting and are profitable to grow. So we, that's what we do, uh, basically. And then the field crops are quite standard, normal crops that go for... And your operation 
you've described it as carbon negative and, and yeah. you're building soil, are you? I mean, you yeah. just because not many people have been able to practice the system you're running for whatever it is, 46 years and see the impact of their practices on outcomes. So what data have you got? What are your observations? The basis is, is, is looking at the different aspects of the farm. The woodlands have to be looked after because they're the, the prime source of, of, of the birds, uh, the resting ground, the shelter for the birds. Then you've got the field margins that we've got to build up. Then you've got the hedges and we treasure our hedges. We will let them grow and then we'll cut them by hand um, every once every seven years and take the wood chip that is made from, that comes from that and use that in the composting that goes back on the field uh, in part and we then have sought the, the, the basis of soil that we look after through the composting primarily and the rotations uh, and that is important and we have built up soil we have a continual development small in the case of fields but it's what the same sort of figure that you would expect from most good um, sustainable or resilient farms and in the greenhouses the increase in the organic matter content is phenomenal which gives you an enormous fertility bank that provides a resilience and in resilience for, for us is really the word the operative word everything is about resilience you can be sustainable well, as you like but if you're not resilient it doesn't matter so much so if uh, I'm going to have to stop you, I think, because we'll come back in the discussion. But if your your template, which you developed, could be applied and you used anywhere in the world, couldn't it? Because it doesn't seem to me that it's particular to West Wales what you're doing. It's scalable in, in a local sort of way. Would you agree with that? I mean, completely. We've always said that the, the, the problems in, in changing the, the global agriculture are identical in every part of the world. They just are tweaked at the edges. It's about soil, and soil works in the same way, whether you're in Alaska or whether you're in South America, or whether you're in West Wales. The ingredients and the management will vary in part, of course, but the principles are identical. And so, and people are, have communities all over the world, identical, obviously. And so the model we're doing here, people are doing what we're doing all over the world. There's not a part of the world where it's not being practiced. And that's what gives me the encouragement to say that this will be the future. Uh, it has to be the future, because if we take the, the primary requirements of attention to climate, attention to health, Health, human health and environmental health, attention to water needs and to human uh, spirit, then it's difficult to see how else you would sculpt a, a pathway that we can all follow with enthusiasm. Well, thank you very much, Peter. Um, I'm hoping that we might be able to host an event here when all this lockdown ends. Maybe we can, um, maybe you'll allow a few people to come and see you if it's safe. Uh -huh. Anyway, uh, on to our third <laughs> Pam Warhurst is, has um, mobilized thousands, if not millions of people to think more about growing their own food with her incredible project, Incredible Edible. So Pam, would you like to describe what you've done? and raise some of the issues that we were talking about yesterday in our sort of pre-conversation and uh, re respond to the two previous speakers. Over to you, Pam. Thank you. Thank you, Patrick. Yeah, I'd be delighted to. Um, my angle is what it feels like to be someone living in a community, living in a town, living in a village, living in a neighbourhood, caring about their family, their community, their neighbours, um, caring about food but not necessarily being connected with it in any way as we've had generations, decades of disconnect. So incredible edible was started 11 years ago. We've been going 11 years. We started in a market town in the north of England. We're spread into 100 and different, 150 different communities all over the UK and the stories we tell impact on people's perceptions and motivations worldwide. Um, it was started because we were concerned about um, how ordinary folks were going to fare 
in the big issues that are coming around the, you know, the corner with climate change. Um, and we use food as what we call our Trojan horse, but food as our way of engaging um, as many people as possible in thinking about how they're living their lives, how they're spending their money, what jobs they're actually doing, what sort of communities they live in, what the spaces look like, how they live, whatever. We use food because that is our shared language. Whatever our age or our income or our culture or our ability, we have an interest in food. Um, so if we are to try and help people think through how they're living their lives and think about the food they're eating, where it's coming from, what it's doing to the planet, how it's impacting on their families' lives. If that's what we're going to do, we started a very simple model that was action-based, not report written, um, that was all about three things. Could we grow food in the middle of our towns and our cities and our neighborhoods in very public places in order to stimulate a conversation around what what is that? Uh, I've never seen that before. What do I do with it? I remember grandma used to grow those in the greenhouse or, or whatever. Could we create what we've called propaganda gardens all over the place um, that stimulate a conversation about food which in an experiment we hoped might stimulate a conversation around environment, around biodiversity, around choice, around where you shop. We didn't know, but 11 years ago we thought if people see food growing normally, apples, raspberries, kale, herbs, whatever, as they walk to school, as they walk to the doctors, as they go to work, whatever it was, that might have an impact on people's thought processes around what it was they were putting on their plate and where they were buying it from. The second plate was about, that's all very well and good, but as we are a movement for everybody, and we've got a catchphrase that says, if you eat, you're in. It is true that people are increasingly interested in provenance. People are increasingly interested in organic. People are increasingly interested in that distinctiveness. But the vast majority of people, there are millions of people in this country who can't peel a potato, who have no idea about soil, who have never been encouraged to think about cooking from scratch and who remain in that situation even through COVID. So how do we encourage those people as they walk through their towns, looking at these weird things growing all over the place at the police station, at the railway station or wherever, how do we encourage them to think, oh, that could be for me? So what we do is we start conversations with the folks that already live there. We do not ask for money. We do not ask policymakers to write policies about it. We, you know, because they're way behind the, uh, the story of where we ought to be going, sadly. Um, so we share. We find people who visit us from other shores who can cook great food and we have conversations with them about it. We talk to more elderly citizens about what they're pickling, bottling, or what they used to do in the war, or whatever. We remind people of when we took over parks and had allotments because we wanted to grow more of our own food. We find those community people, those leaders in our community who know how to do stuff with food and can cook great meals on the cheap. That's the learning plate. And we hope to influence what our families and our kids are doing through that, rather than the approach that we tried to introduce at the moment, which was influenced at the beginning, the curriculum and through schools, which was almost impossible because they'd got boxes to tick and they'd got league tables to rise in. And basically horticulture and growing was for thickies, not for people who wanted to succeed in life. How wrong were they? So that was the second plate. And the third plate was a, was a simple experiment that said, if people are walking past food, and seeing it growing. And if people are getting a buzz around what they can do with it around the kitchen table, is it not possible to imagine that if they've got a pound in their pocket, they might want to support local producers? Is it not possible that they might want to go sometimes for the first time into their local market, taste the local cheese, ask about the potted brawn, have a slice of that local baked bread, be interested in a pint of local beer, whatever it might be, instead of doing what they're doing, which is nip into the supermarket and back because they've got two or three jobs, they haven't got any time and they need to get it as cheap as they can. So the idea around Incredible Edible was just to stimulate those thought processes because ultimately, without demand, you can supply what you want, but you're not going to succeed.
So how do we actually stimulate demand so it meets innovative suppliers, local suppliers halfway and creates the resilience that Peter was starting to talk about? And that is the story of Incredible Edible. And through the 11 years, from our angle, from the pavement side of things, what we've started to see is we've got some asks. We want more land to grow our food on. We want to make sure that all these community spaces that are stewarded by public sector, but not owned by public sector, it is public land, are shifted so that there is a right of the citizen to grow food in their locality. That's what we want. And that would complement the stuff that's going on in the markets, on the farms. It doesn't take over from that, but it adds to it. The second thing is we want to stimulate the locals, the skills that are going to be needed when we have to grow a lot of more, our own food more locally. We want to support our urban farmers. We want to introduce alternative growing techniques. We want to inspire the architects to create buildings you can grow up the side of or on the top of or down in the cellar of or whatever it might be. So that we might imagine that the kids that are coming through that system might well want to be those urban food heroes that we're going to need in a really short period of time not only that they may be able to help the children of people we've never met in our entire lives because we are going to have some huge global problems and we've seen some positive stuff around that because uh, some years ago we tried with in partnership with our local high school uh, to create what we called an aqua garden where we we were stimulating interest in soil science in hydroponics and in aquaponics and it fell foul of the mainstream curriculum and ultimately after seven years we had to fold but what we had achieved during those seven years as a community as volunteers was we brought on apprentices who are still in the food sector and eventually having passed over the assets to the school the school are now introducing a horticultural course for the first time in many many years so something happened with that and the third thing around the business play is that our markets are growing. Our local restaurants prior to COVID were all introducing local food in some way, which stimulated whether farmers had large flocks of geese or whatever it might be, it stimulated because we the people wanted it. And what we are starting to ask is, hey, health, if you're going to do something about population health, maybe you should support local markets. Maybe you should use social prescribing to upskill your citizens to grow their own food. Maybe you should think about institutional engagement by getting out of the way of the citizens enjoying good local food and actually getting in there and helping them do it. So we want to see, you know, more, we want to see the city regions, the metro mayors and the local authorities as they think through how they kickstart the economy, thinking about our children and thinking about their possibilities of getting jobs in local economies, being that next generation of food growers and making it easy for them in any financially incentivized way they want for ordinary folks to be part of the solution to how we produce local good food within our planetary resources, rather than being seen as they are now as some sort of victims to be done to. Well, we're not victims to be done to. We're actually part of the kindness we want to grow in our societies through a local food economy. Pam, it's very inspiring to listen to you and it's incredible what you've achieved in generating understanding and knowledge and engagement at a community level from the ground up. If you've got any, just very briefly, if you've got any sort of uh, stories about the impact in terms of scale, you know, do you think that what you've done is mobilizing a new movement of understanding at grassroots level to get more involved do you feel that it's it's gaining momentum yeah i do i i do but um you, but i personally don't like scale you spread human activity you don't scale right. it and let's, what i'm doing is, uh, yeah, production mm -hmm. is scale but mm -hmm. human activity is spread and we are seeing spread and what we need is to collaborate with more people who are on that same journey so it's not us in our little silos because this is a steep mountain to climb we can all pretend that everybody's dead interested and we've got zillions of food boxes all over the place which we have but actually in the long term 
is that has that got a critical mass that's big enough to push those procurement budgets where they ought to be, to push those investment programs around abattoirs and local market as they should be? Not yet. But if collectively, the 5,000 plus people that we've got being incredible edible, with the God knows how many people you've got, Vicky, involved in all that, with all the other, if, if collectively we come around this grassroots push and start to demand that we can have more spaces to grow on, more opportunities to buy local, and make sure that our next generation of people are well skilled in what to do around food, whether that's formally or informally, that's spreading. And, and I think we've got an opportunity now on the back of this COVID, to get on the back of those people that Vicky's been talking about, but to embrace the millions that aren't in that cohort, to see if we can shift the national, the regional and the local thinking to start putting money where its mouth needs to be, which is behind more local procurement. Well, we're very lucky to have you in the world right now, Pam, so thank you very, <laughs> very much. Pleasure. Uh, we, we, we should open this up now. Uh, Adele, can you... Um, navigate this a little bit because you've been following the chat i think it would be good if we you know you identified specific questions to any of the three speakers or issues that you think they all want to comment on absolutely so i think i've been trying to kind of collate questions into themes and i think the biggest theme that's come up so far is how we can prevent those people that have been as vicky said um um, increasing demand for veg box schemes and buying produce uh, from from local sources where possible how can we prevent them going back to shopping in supermarkets uh, for convenience food um, and another question which came in was related to that around what role do the supermarkets have to play in this if any at all be really interested to hear your views on that well let's start with those let, let me go to the that, to peter for this for Vicky's, which she raised the question, as you said, Peter. Do you think that once all this recedes, uh, this is a permanent change, and whether it is or not, how can we be more active in persuading people to stay engaged in this new way of, of sourcing local, you know, properly produced food? I, I, I'm okay. convinced. Uh, over the years that the more that you taste and enjoy food that's produced from a soil that is well managed and active and alive the more you will never want to stop eating it and therefore our work has to be to try to convince as many people as possible to keep trying to buy some produce locally as for as long as possible until such time as they absorb the different ethos what's the plural of ethos um uh into their, their being i mean that's i mean because nobody buys such food for one reason only there's a whole range of reasons and we have to bring them all into in, uh, encompass them all into the act of purchase uh, my feeling is that people will stay with it uh, quite a lot quite a lot. Uh, I think it's not going to go back. Well, let me, may I share a little story, which I think is relevant to you, Peter. Um, Ceredigion, this part of West Wales, has, I think, the lowest average household income in the UK. Certainly, it's right near the bottom. And yet, due, I think, to a very considerable degree to the operation you used to run when you were supplying all the supermarkets, in some cases, notably Waitrose, with all its organic produce, uh, there was an outgrade shop which you ran in Lampeter, which I think had the effect of educating the palates of many thousands of people in this neck of the woods, as a result of which uh, there are more committed, organic, um, proper local food eaters round here than you would believe possible, given that it's got a very low income average. So I think that's rather an interesting story and it sort of con consolidates what you said about learning through your palate and then making, becoming a committed eater of better food. Do you th do, what do you think about what I've just said? Well, I, I think it's interesting if I extend your, your comments by saying that Keradigion has, has one of the lowest, if not the second, second lowest, 
uh, incidence of COVID um, cases in the whole country. And so the correlation between income level and incidence and food quality is not quite what you would expect, and, but we're very pleased without being complacent. <laughs> of course. Now, I want to just one, one more comment from you, Peter. Um, you didn't mention what happened, but basically the supermarkets uh, you, that you used to supply, uh, when you started Organic Farm Foods, you had this brilliant, in my view, um, idea of setting up regional pack houses and local pack houses so that local growers would be able to supply into the supermarkets through their regional and local pack house. And the supermarkets introduced this policy of category management, where, which eventually ends up with only one pack house for every uh, species of vegetable or carcass of lamb or whatever for the whole of the United Kingdom. And uh, as a result of which, I would say, um, and they also gave all the organic supply to their conventional suppliers. So those two things had a devastating effect on your business. So it, you seem to be in a rather good position to comment on whether the supermarkets can have part of this renaissance of local food. Uh, I think, th yes, they can. Of course they can. There were, there are, they remain where a lot of people go to shop. But as people become more uh, demanding in the requirements they have of the quality of food that they're purchasing, then they will find it very difficult to, for the supermarkets to meet those requirements. It just isn't possible because they are still, no matter how good the producers will be uh, to get a good food, they will still, unless they change the system entirely and break their whole model down, which they spent 20, 30 years building up, I don't see how they can really change. They could go into a situation where they give up selling food, and we've long talked about that, give up selling food and actually make their money out of real estate and renting out the space to lots of local producers to, to do it. That's which is what you've done, isn't it, in Lampeter? Well, it's what we're trying to do in, in, in different areas here with trying to encourage re retailers to give over part of their shop to a, a local producer and allow the producer the freedom of re um, setting pricing, uh, setting range, setting all these things, but actually protecting the margins of the, the retailers so they're not... Um, they're not needing to take such huge margins because we're actually stepping in to support the quality aspect of the, the trade. And that seems to be working terribly well. And people- Do you think like, supermarkets could do that? I think, I don't see why not. I mean, their business is to make money and that's all that they're really interested in. Whether they make it out of this particular aspect of the business or that, isn't really terribly important. I mean, all these companies change. Every corporation in the world is not the same model today that it was 50 years ago. You know, look at Kodak or any of these things. Everything changes. So why can't the supermarkets change if the consumer pushes them to that level? Well, that's very, that's very generous of you to, to speak like that. Vicky, what do you have to say about this, these two questions? Yeah, you I know. think it's a really, really interesting um, model that you're presenting there. And one thing that I've been and my colleagues will be working with is the, um, the co-ops and the independent stores and those, you know, what they call symbol groups and making sure they're getting... Um, the same kind of help that the big multiples are getting in this period to provide their customers with a range of fresh produce and a range of good produce that they need. Because a lot of people, particularly in big and low comes, do small frequent shops to those smaller convenience stores. Um, and they should be able to provide a decent, you know, a decent meal for people. So that's, that's one part of it. And I think they could, you know, they could, because they use wholesale, they're not so set up as you know very much embedded in the just in time very centralized as as uh, category management as patrick described those systems they can shift and they can change and they can take other other supplies in so they could be part of it whether the multiples can i i don't know i'm interested in 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 a way in developing the alternatives and developing new ways of routes to market for, for people and regenerating the high street by having independent shops um, other other types of um, 
uh, trading systems. And I think those, if those can grow, some people have suggested they should grow up to 10% of the market. I think bigger, why not bigger? Um, but the, the other thing just to mention is that a lot of the box schemes have actually prioritized getting food to the most vulnerable. So some people are asking questions about that. You know, it's, it's no good talking about these elite sort of um, uh, organic high, you know, high cost stuff that i um, talking about, but a lot of them are organic and they're providing for, for people on low income. So it's, it's not an absolute given that we're talking about elite produce here at all. We're talking about a movement for local food for everybody. Um, what Pam was talking about, you know, I think it's about a movement. It isn't about a, a category or a marketing. That movement will will grow, and we need to let a thousand flowers bloom, as they say. And and you know, and some will fail, and some won't. And um, but we need to stop the huge amount of support going for for the other side, the, the poor food systems, um, because they get a lot of tax breaks. They get a lot of they're doing tax dodging there's a lot going on that we don't know about and that should end and so it's it's, it's balancing that's why the policy work is important balancing that up but also well, if, letting people if, find new ways of doing it if this conversation generates interest maybe we could have another go at uh, engaging one or two supermarket people that would be fascinating to hear their response to this yeah. um see what happens well you but know as well as i do patrick when we launched food miles back in the middle of the 1990s the report we got one supermarket who came to us and said yeah we're interested and they were thinking of doing food boxes in their car park you know and getting local food schemes going or on the edges of their stores and that some of that's happened some of them have embraced local food but it, it's not it's not got the values that we're talking about here i think but yes quick comment Pam, do you want to say anything to what Peter and Vicky have said? Well, look, well, only from the streets perspective, it seems to me that uh, all that is all that is right, and all the incredible edibles tried to do is not be anti anything because it's the easiest thing in the world to do, but to be pro an alternative proposition that makes yeah. a lot more sense. Mm. And all that anybody with any common sense on the ground would have to say is, first of all, are we? One of the issues we've got is how we measure what good looks like. Mm. And one of the things that's coming out of COVID is that we're actually thinking around, sorry, we're actually thinking around, well, maybe it's not about pensioners and pens, maybe it's also about measuring health and well-being, maybe that's how we should be thinking about where our investment's going in, mm. maybe it's about that sense of place and happiness. So there's something around, if you keep measuring it in a certain way, you'll always get the tax situation mm. that you'll always get. Mm. So, so that's one thing. The other thing is, how come, and Vicky's point about procurement, what we want to see is the health service investing in good quality local food and the ability for everybody to be part of that equation. What we want to see is, is to make sure that the experience of the supermarket, which is all about convenience and nothing else, mm. well, price, I guess, but predominantly convenience, what we want to see is that the alternatives are as convenient, easy to get to, open the right hours, have the type of um, service so you don't have to lug 5k of potatoes down the street because you've not got a car off. We want to see a new normal and we want to see that playing field between, uh, between the high street and the market leveled out, not just the free parking at the supermarket, but we want to make sure that we've got a level playing field so that all the public investment supports the right type of private investment so that we the citizens can eat good food so that's kind Thank of you. what it feels like to us and it can all be done if we measured it differently and we had the will to show that if we want to deal with the health issues we've got and the climate change that's coming around the corner food is a key component if we get that right the rest follows thank you uh adele we're running a bit short of time now are we how are we doing We've got about another seven or eight minutes left. So perhaps uh, for one more round of questions and then some kind of wrapping up thoughts, but uh, a couple of questions have come in around, how can we encourage people to think more about seasonality, um, you know, perhaps aligning their diets with the productive capacity of the local area around them? Um, what do the panelists think about that? I suppose it's more of a kind of education question. Anything else you want to bring up if this is the last round? Um, there's also some questions about uh, what we should suggest 
um, should be in the national food strategy around local food um, and also whether or not there's a role for whether it's counties or regions having individual food strategies I know Gloucestershire is on it already and I'm sure some of the others are as well um, but I suppose the the question is what's the role of national policy versus local policies for okay encouraging so two, this? two things there for each of you to comment on uh, the role of the governments and authorities in stimulating uh, the change that we're obviously all, th all three speakers are, are wanting to see. And the, the first question about how we can encourage more people to understand the importance of aligning their diets to what the producers in their area can produce. Peter's point about green stuff at this time of year, uh, it's an education challenge. So uh, who shall I go to? Pam, do you want to start on those two? Well, I guess what I'd say is I'd like to align the school desk with the kitchen table. You know, I mean, it makes complete sense that uh, children are educated in school to understand some of these things. And, it, you know, about the importance of soil, about the importance of seasonality, the importance of biodiversity, that we are one species. All, all that is important. And then that needs to be taken through to the sorts of campaigns and the sorts of information, maybe on products or whatever it might be, so that there's a consistency of message around the quality of that food and the season in which it was produced. And the more people that actually engage through whatever means, whether it's care farming or it's incredible edible or it's sustain or whatever, in growing for themselves and cooking for themselves, they then automatically start to understand what can grow when. People aren't stupid, it's just that they are detached from the process of growing. Yeah. And as everybody can't at the moment get onto a farm, the more of us that are encouraged to actually grow, that opens the door of, of knowledge to what you actually need to grow and what is a waste of time at the wrong time of the year. So and what about, know, that what, consistency what, of message is important. What about what the governments, you know, what do you think interventions, if we go to spread this you know, in the way that the planet needs and we all need, what can governments and other agencies well, I go back to the thing that that um, that we've been talking about, um, which is opening up the possibility of citizens having the right to grow food in community spaces. You know, they can change that. They don't have to take ownership, but they can say it is normal and it is right that if citizens want to grow food, they can grow food. So that would be one thing. It would happen if we had a war happening. We have kind of got a war happening. It's called climate change. So the second thing would be they absolutely need to change the flipping curriculum and they need to make sure that the importance of food is at the heart of every element of the cu curriculum you can use you can stimulate good practice of teaching steam through food there's no doubt about it whatsoever and that doesn't happen and that's not normal except in a few notable exceptions and the third thing is we need to incentivize that local food outlet that smaller outlet if we can give small outlets tax breaks in times of covid we can also give small food outlets important breaks so that they you know they are not disadvantaged at the moment as they are supermarkets get free parking local shops you have to pay for your parking how can that type of thing be right so again let's make some fiscal incentives to local markets and okay. local food suppliers that would help thank you very much right uh, vicky yeah, very quickly, local authorities need to have the responsibility and the capacity and the, the budgets to um, develop local food plans that embrace a lot of what we've been talking about um, for everybody. And we, the local, the Sustainable Food Cities partnerships that are across the country, that's a movement and that's doing that. What we're saying is that all the plans they're developing for climate and emergency, which a lot of local authorities are, needs to include food and we're providing some tools for them to, to look at that. For instance, peri-urban food growing. You know, there's a lot of land that could be used for um, food growing, and urban, but peri-urban is, is quite a lot of good land. We've identified what's available in London. We need to do it in other cities and press for local authorities to be able to actually help enterprises to go on that land. And it could be community enterprises. It can be, you know, commercial enterprises. It can be, you know, wh whatever, you know, is, is people are willing to do. And it can provide jobs as well as good food, as well as carbon storage if it's orchard. Mm or fruit shrubs, you know, there's carbon storage stocks there. So let's 
combine the, the, the benefits and you can get nature and access to nature and farmland through that. But I think there's loads that can be done at local level, but they're cash strapped, the austerity, you know, let that green recovery needs to embrace food and farming, green recovery at a local and a regional level. And I absolutely agree, we need to balance out the tax breaks and all that kind of stuff, which has been completely in the favour of the multiples, as we've known for 30 years, Patrick. And so it's not happened, but maybe this will be the stimulus and people will be demanding. So getting people to demand, getting people to shout about this will be good. Getting people involved in local partnerships in a small way as well as a big way. You know, getting people to be food citizens, just not, not only food consumers, but also food growers, as Pam says. Um, so where they haven't got land, then they haven't got gardens or even um, uh, balconies. We want more community food growing, community food gardens. And that's, a, that's something actually we've just got a new project going on that. But we've got a lot of information on our website about that. But uh, yeah, there's, local is, is key. But uh, yeah, I'll, just, I'll leave it there. Thank you. And uh, Peter, do you want to comment on either of the two issues? The, uh, yeah, the two, two, two very quick um Quick points. Uh, one is we mustn't forget that there are many thousands of farmers in this country who are suffering all sorts of problems at the moment because of the imbalancing of the market and they, most of them will have children that are coming into taking over the farm at some time and it would not surprise me if many of them with their parents were looking at having a different system. So if they wanted to go into fresh produce, for example, taking my own particular interest, there are hardly any colleges, horticultural colleges left. So education is the primary requirement for the state, whatever state it is, um, to encourage local authorities to develop, because without the education it will be harder. Secondly, um, I would say on the out of season question, Try the in-season product more often, and then you won't want to go back to the false imposter. Brilliant. Thank One you. thing I did want to say, Patrick, extra, is it doesn't all have to be seasonally eaten. It's seasonally grown, but it could be processed, put into pies, put into, you know, meals that then traded as locally as possible for a trader. You know, there's, there's ways around that as well. It doesn't all have to be seasonally eaten. Well, uh, are we right out of time, or have we got a closing remark from each person, Adele? Is it, is, have we got a minute? Yeah. Hello? <laughs> She's probably... Sorry, I'm on mute. Sorry. That, uh, I was saying, got another, let's go for another minute or so. Okay. Well, um, perhaps, um, I mean, I think it's been a very fascinating discussion. And uh, it feels as though we've, you've, we've brought together three very different perspectives, but very complementary perspectives on this change that it seems to me is trying to happen. Um, maybe because of COVID, it's going to happen much more fast, more rapidly than would otherwise have been the case. Um, so bearing in mind everything that's been said, do you want to have just one message to the people who are tuned into this webinar i think quite a lot of them are farmers and land managers is that right so actually there is quite a few people peter the the point you've just made about people in dis, a, a decision mode about the next generation that is a fascinating thing that you've the issue you've raised there do you think that there are opportunities here for young people to get involved in really taking this up to another level. And any other final comments in 30 seconds? So I'll start with you again, Peter. Uh, the answer is yes. I mean, the increase in demand for locally grown food, in my experience, has been rising for the last five, six, seven, eight, nine years. So it's not going to do anything else and carry on. How quickly, we will see. And secondly, the disasters that are besetting the conventional farming industry that you will know from your own experience Patrick at home is so great is so threatening to their, their future that anything is possible and therein lies a cautionary tale because if we get an unregulated or ill-disciplined 
change in market activities that can cause total chaos and the consumer at the end of the day will be the poorer for it. Well, I would love to comment on that because I think that's fascinating, but that's probably another conversation. You're so right about the disruption and the pain that the farming community has inflicted on itself without intending to as a result of intensification and globalization of our food systems. But that's another, another discussion. So, um, Pam, what would you like to say? I guess I just want to say that uh, when we're dealing with these really big issues that, that have to have scalable supply at a more localized level i get that just don't forget the power of advocacy on the street if you remember that we are there we want to support you with the pen in our pocket we just sometimes feel we're in a different silo so let's join up thank you so much and vicky you've got I suppose to find I, I ask everybody to take the um action that i've put on the chat um to lobby your mp because the reading of the, the third reading of the agriculture bill is tomorrow we need some real changes to that. And also, I've also put in the chat some links to two pages um, on our website, which is pages about how farmers can um, start to sell more direct or use um, tools that sell, like Open Farm Network and others. So there's a whole load of them. And for consumers to eat direct, there's pages there as well. So if we, you know, both need to happen and consumers supporting farmers is, is, is key, but also joining campaigns, be citizens as well as consumers. All right. Well, thank you very, very much, uh, Vicky, for that. Um, I'll just put in a word for the Sustainable Food Trust since I'm moderating. Um, you can visit our website. You can sign up to our newsletter. You can follow us on Instagram or Twitter. Um, but I'll end by thanking our three contributors, speakers. I thought you all gave so much. I thought you were all brilliant, actually. And I, I've, I've been so stimulated by this conversation, learnt a lot. Uh, so thank you very much. And uh, I gather that this has been recorded. Um, perhaps, Adele, you could just tell people how they can get hold of it if they want to listen to it again. Absolutely. So we, yeah, we've recorded the session and um, it will be on the Land Management 2.0 website as well as Twitter page, LinkedIn page as soon as possible basically and uh, we'll be announcing more of these roundtable themes over the coming days so keep an eye out on the social media again um we'll be having a couple of sessions next week so thank you so much for everyone for joining for all your really interesting questions thank you to the panelists thank you pleasure thank you right. goodbye bye. all bye Talk bye soon. bye well that's interesting <laughs> How do we go? Leave meeting, I guess. Uh, that, that's the one. <laughs> that's the one yeah. <laughs> uh, I'm getting, I, I'm losing it. I, I, I did a, a funeral in Canada the other day. In this, this did you? Wow. Good God. <laughs> that was incredible. Anyway, I'm off. Bye. All right. Thank you so thank much. Thank you, Peter. Peter. That's very good. Excellent. Tim, is there a way to stop it broadcasting or um just just closing it down okay thanks patrick <clears throat>